Welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program. My name is Helen Liu, and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. I want to thank the Friends of Cary Library for sponsoring this program. I'd also like to thank the public libraries in Ashland, Bedford, Broughton, Needham, Tewksbury, Randall Library in Stowe, and Thomas Crane Library in Quincy for partnering with us on this program. Although you don't need a pass to visit Mount Auburn Cemetery, I do want to mention that this program is part of our Beyond the Library series, which introduces attendees to the many fun and educational opportunities that our Museum Pass program offers. Currently, Cary Library has 23 discounted passes to a variety of wonderful places, so please check with your local library for information on their Museum Pass program. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please submit them to the Q&A or chat and Meg will answer them at the end of the program. Meg presented a history of Mont Auburn Cemetery back in March. You can view that program on our YouTube channel. I will add the link to the chat. I'll also include it in the recap when I send a link to the recording. I'm delighted to welcome back Meg Winslow. Meg is Curator of Historical Collections and Archives at Mount Auburn Cemetery, where for 30 years, she has been responsible for developing and overseeing the cemetery's permanent collections, including more than 3,500 linear feet of archives and significant artistic monuments on the grounds. Meg is co-author with Melissa Banta of The Art of Commemoration and America's First Rural Cemetery. Mount Auburn's significant monument collection in its third printing. She currently serves on the sculpture committee for the Friends of the Boston Public Garden and at Mount Auburn has a deep love of the connection between art and nature. Welcome back, Meg. It is so nice to see you. Hi, Helen. Thank you so much and uh, welcome to everyone this evening. I am I'm honored to be returning to your um, series of virtual programs. I think it's just a terrific community resource. I just want to come to all of your programs. <laughs> and thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, it's a great resource. I'd also like to thank, um, in addition to Helen for putting this all together, um, Ethy Slate and the Friends of of Cary Library. What a wonderful resource we have in our, in our community. Tonight, I am going to be introducing you to Mount Auburn Cemetery in neighboring Cambridge and Watertown, and uh, really focusing on the monuments, but at the beginning, giving you a little bit of an introduction to this uh, really internationally renowned landscape that's also a great a community resource, almost like a, a library outside where you can learn layers of information about uh, the Boston area and our, our world and our communities. I thought I'd begin by sharing four of the landmarks that make up part of the landscape and then we'll um, delve into some of the highlights of the monument collection, a collection of commemorative art that spans about 200 years almost from 1831 when the cemetery was founded uh, all the way uh, through the Civil War to 1917. So welcome and uh, I hope you enjoy, enjoy the slides. I try to try to put some beautiful images together for you. And I look forward, actually I look forward to um, having some questions at the end too. Uh, so please hold your questions until the end. That would be really uh, wonderful to see what you'd, you'd like to know. Mount Auburn uh, Cemetery was established in 1831 by the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And it, the reason for its founding was Boston had run out of burial space. Their small burying grounds um, were full and the, the crypts in the churches were full. And so Boston needed a place to bury their citizens. And the Massachusetts Horticultural Society needed an experimental garden. And so that joint venture is really the origin story of Mount Auburn, which found was founded, you know, in the summer of 1831 with a very 
ambitious vision. It, it was a practical solution to providing a, a burial space for the people of Boston, but also it was very aspirational in that the members of the Horticultural Society wanted this to be a place where people from all walks of life would visit and leave better for it, leave better for their visit. Uh, very, uh, very important as a new idea because the cemeteries in in um, in Boston and before Mount Auburn were very functional. And as as you'll see, um, this was quite a different quite a different landscape. Our mission is to comfort the bereaved and inspire the living and commemorate and bury the dead in a landscape of exceptional beauty. Mount Auburn is one of my favorite places in the world. And maybe some of you have, have just driven by and not gone in. So we welcome you to come through this iconic gateway uh, of stone, of Quincy granite, and experience the beauty of this remarkable landscape. The cemetery is open every day, 365 days of the year, and the gates are open from dawn until dusk. I think they close about six uh, now in the winter, but the, the cemetery is open until eight at night. There's no charge. Everyone is, uh, is welcome to come in, and we're very excited to have some new pedestrian gateways. So if you don't want to come through this iconic front gateway, there are some more entrances all along Mount Auburn Street on the road in between Harvard Square and Watertown on uh, at 580 Mount Auburn Street. Uh, and if you want to visit, you can always visit the website to find out more. You can also park in the cemetery um, anywhere where there's it's not a main uh, throughway. Um, which is marked with a green line. So I hope you all feel welcome to come, not just for memorial services or burial services, but for birding and for walking and for admiring the trees. The cemetery is an internationally renowned arboretum. There are more than 5,000, oh my gosh, there are more than 5,000 kinds of trees and they could not be more magnificent at this time of year. Um, the cemetery is also a very important uh, birding site designated by the Audubon Society and it's a wildlife refuge. And what's really so remarkable about it is that it brings this experience of being in nature and having a reflective, contemplative, time in the middle of this kind of urban sprawl. So you walk through the gates and this is what you find, this incredibly tended and cared for landscape that's a commemorative landscape. Um, it's a new idea uh, for a landscape. Um, the cemetery is a national historic landmark because of its landscape and um, you know, the, the gateway that just we just walked through was intended to be very permanent, it, you know, to convey a sense of permanence. It was intended to be sublime and welcoming and really serve as a transition from one world in, into this amazing landscape. There are more than 100 thousand people buried here at Mount Auburn. So as you can imagine, it's a sacred space where we remember and we commemorate and we honor all the different people, um, incredible people from all around the world are buried here, um, including, I'll just, I'll just read some of the names, the author Bernie Malamud, Julia Ward Howe, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Harriet Jacobs, who uh, escaped to freedom here up in Massachusetts and wrote an incredible book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, that was her story. The um, museum founder and incredible art collector, Isabella Stewart Gardner is buried here. The inventor Buckminster Fuller 
beloved poet, uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow is here and the great American illustrator and um, artist Winslow Homer is also buried here at Mount Auburn along with thousands of other people. You know, the cemetery really becomes uh, a landscape of memory and a landscape of stories, a landscape of humanity. It's very different from a recreational park because these lives are, are remembered here. So just to give you a little background, in the summer of 1831, the Massachusetts legislature gives the Horticulture Society permission to buy land that would be used as an experimental garden and an ornamental cemetery. And the, the sale of lots for burial would um, help pay for an experimental garden for the Horticulture Society. And then the cemetery would be ornamented, not only with works of art and three-dimensional monuments, but it would be planted and embellished with shrubberies and blooming flowers and plants and trees and walks and paths and rural ornaments, meaning cast iron fences and hitching posts and um, cast iron benches and statuary urns and planters, all of these elements combining to create a landscape that was natural and beautiful, but enhanced by the human hand. So just to give you some bearings, on, on the right is a visitor map the cemetery is 175 acres, and the entrance, the primary entrance is here, if you can see my cursor, on Mount Auburn Street, 580 Mount Auburn Street. Um, there's a central green line that you can drive around, and there are these broad, winding, uh, what used to be carriage avenues interspersed with walking paths. Um, there are one, two, three, sheets of water and a small vernal pool in the middle. On the highest summit, there's a wonderful uh, observatory tower that gives you a panoramic view, one of the landmarks of the cemetery uh, that we'll be looking at. The first map that was drawn of the cemetery is much smaller than the visitor map that I just showed you because the original purchase of the land was only 72 acres. And over time, different lots of lands were added to create the, the landscape that we have today. But this was a really remarkably important map. There's no art on it now. And I know we'll be talking about the art, but I really look at this as a work of art itself. The, the map was uh, created by a young man from, um, from Portland, Maine, who came down to work for Henry Dearborn, who was the uh, president of the Horticulture Society. And he, this is his painting, he is the one who, who did this map, a map um, that Americans had never seen before because of its very naturalistic design. It's, it's a special map and part of why the landscape is so important because you can see it and feel it today when you visit. The first, um, the first building, in addition to the receiving tomb, uh, was the uh, was the front entrance gateway. And what's kind of wonderful about it. They really put it up quickly in 1832, the year after the cemetery was established, but it was built in wood. And it was built in wood, dusted with paint and um, stone to look like stone. And they, they put it up kind of as a model. And then 10 years later, in 1842, it was built in Quincy granite and was the largest, biggest Quincy granite capstone that had ever been erected. Something that um, was uh, very distinctive and here for the ages. It's also interesting because Jacob Bigelow, who was the second president of Mount Auburn and one of the founders, he designed it in the Egyptian revival style because he liked the Egyptian revival style and how it related to the Egyptians caring for their dead. 
also how the Egyptian style um, kind of meant a, a sense of permanence because Napoleon was was finding all these uh, wonderful works of art in the landscape in Egypt in the 1700s. And that inspired this style here in the Boston area. It was very popular. Also, Mount Auburn Cemetery was non-sectarian. And right from the beginning, that means it was open to everyone, whatever their race or whatever their faith. Everyone was welcome to be buried at Mount Auburn and welcome to visit in Mount Auburn. So Jacob Bigelow designed the gateway. He also designed the first chapel. And that was meant to be a place for melancholy reflection and maybe a repository for statuary and works of marble artwork that wouldn't um, last in an outdoor, but it became very quickly popular for uh, funeral services that moved from the home to, to Mount Auburn. And Bigelow Chapel today is just uh, renovated to in include a lot of um, space around the first historic building for gathering and events, for being part of a cremation on the on the left side of the building, there's a, a crematory that was created in 1900. And so that's always a good reminder to visitors that, um, you know, we're a very active functioning cemetery um, with a crematory. So uh, we have many layers of visitors uh, here at Mount Auburn. The inside of Bigelow Chapel is quite stunning. It's it's small, it's jewel-like, and it has very early stained glass that dates from the 1840s that came from Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, we weren't really making stained glass in this country yet, and so Jacob Bigelow had correspondence with the stained glass craftsmen in Edinburgh and wrote what he wanted, and we have all those records in our archival collections that document his wishes for the building that he designed. And particularly beautiful is this center rose that Ballantyne and Allen painted uh, of an angel holding uh, two small children, which he thought would have been comforting to the community and appropriate for a funerary chapel. Um, and it was based on this bas-relief by a Danish neoclassical sculptor named Bertolt Thorvaldsen, who was very popular in the, um, in, in the middle class uh, here in the United States. Also, I show you this image because it's also a popular image that you'll see walking out in the landscape. You'll see on the, on the monuments themselves. Sometimes it's a single child, but... Often um, you'll see this on a, a, a mother or a child's stone. Um, it would have been very comforting at the time. The next structure that was built when the cemetery was able to raise the funds was an observatory uh, tower. This fantastic granite Norman style tower. It's made of Quincy granite, 120 feet over the Charles River uh, that connected the, the land of the dead, the silent land to the land of the living, to Boston from the top of the tower. You can have a, an amazing panoramic view. You can see Bunker Hill, the monuments, you can see the Capitol, you can see the stadium at Harvard. And then of course, out to the West, you can see the mountains um, and the surrounding towns. Uh, today, it's just a very popular place to visit and to climb. My kids my kids just love uh, coming up here, and it's a wonderful place to bring visitors. There's another aspect to Mount Auburn, too, in that we have an incredible horticulture staff. And this, this picture of the tower is a little bit earlier, but you can see just the beginnings that there's a wildflower, wonderful wildflower meadow up around the the tower and uh, it's just beautiful with butterflies and dragonflies in, in the spring and um, actually all seasons. Because uh, Bigelow Chapel 
uh, didn't have heat or electricity or a robing room and all these needs as the family's interest in using it uh, grew, a second chapel was built by Willard Sears who actually designed the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and the Provincetown Monument, you know, that big tower, the, I think it's the Pilgrim Monument. He designed that. So he was a local architect and he won, he won the competition to uh, design a, a chapel that was attached to the office, actually, and which we, which we use today. Um, it's, a, it's a place where our visitor center is and where we have programs and events and also memorial and funeral services. We have also the most beautiful restrooms. I think it looks like in this photo, everyone's going to the restroom. There's stained glass in our restroom. It's, it's a nice place to um, stop. So the landscape is really why Mount Auburn is a National Historic Landmark. It, the centrality of our landscape transcends any single aspect of what we do here at Mount Auburn after helping families um, with commemorating and burying people. And uh, it just is the most important part of our work. It's beautiful any time of year, uh, but this, it's actually the most beautiful place I know, I think, you know, in any in any season, but this, this combination of plants, these magnificent trees, you know, probably the most beautiful collection of mature trees that you'll see anywhere, um, water bodies, wildlife habitat, birds and owls and um, natural and handmade elements all combine to create a kind of landscape that you don't see anywhere else. And it's remarkable at Mount Auburn, especially because of this balance of art and, and nature. This naturalistic design of um, gentle curves giving way to vistas of um, works of commemorative art was inspired by, you may know Père Lachaise Cemetery in France, just outside of Paris, which was founded in 1804. But what was remarkable about the design of Mount Auburn is that um, General Henry Dearborn created setbacks between the lots and between the um, the lots and the roads to be planted with flowers and shrubs and trees, and that is the 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 beauty of Mount Auburn: art and nature and balance. So, moving to the monuments now, the original vision would be that families would buy a 300 square foot lot here at Mount Auburn and place a central memorial, surrounded by a tasteful and functional fence, and then as as the generations passed, there would be smaller markers around a central monument. And, you know, when you think about Copps Hill and King's Bearing Ground and, you know, the, the small bearing grounds and graveyards in Concord and, and Lexington and all around our New England towns, this is, this is really a different vision. This is a, a, a large central monument. It's a big three-dimensional marble monument. It's very, very different from these tablets, or we call them root stones that just are slate that go into the ground. Um, now, where did this idea come from? It really came from the classical world that uh, Bostonians were so interested in. They really looked to Europe for the first monuments, and the members of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society were writing to Europe for, for books of prints of monuments, particularly of that cemetery, Père Lachaise. They wanted to erect monuments with inscriptions that people would come and, and read and, and learn from and be inspired to. So really, what a difference uh, from the slates, from the functional slates, from this idea of a sinner to to really putting the grave in the garden and having a, a romantic uh, notion of nature and its ability to heal, console, help, and provide 
solace. It was, uh, you know, a remarkable shift in burial practices that lasted forever here in the United States. And a remarkable outcome of this new cemetery was in Boston, a passion for sculpture. It's really related. It's, you know, we, f we forget what a radical shift it was um, for two centuries of New Englanders to uh, be burying their dead in, in small graveyards and church crypts. And then by having this large, spacious landscape where they could provide a, a dignified, respectful burial um, for the people that they loved. So I thought we'd start with the very first monument that was erected at, at Mount Auburn. It's one of my favorite monuments because it's the first, but also because it's to Anna, Hannah Adams who loved libraries. And she was uh, the first woman to be uh, given a membership in the Boston Athenaeum Library. And, uh, and, and she was an author, she, she was a writer. And this monument is placed right in the center of, of the cemetery, an area called Central Square at the time. And it was raised in her memory by her female friends. And it is, it's exactly what would have been the taste of the time for Boston, because it's a very simple architectural form that we call a pedestal monument. And it has an inscription with um, something that I think her friends hoped would inspire other people. Um, there's a wonderful um, symbol in the top, in the pediment of the top, it looks like a circle. And if you look closely when you're here visiting, you can see it's a, it's a hooped snake eating its tail, um, we call that symbol in Ouroboros. And then if you can see on the slide down at the bottom below the inscription, um, very slightly there's writing that is the signature of the carver, which is always exciting to find. That's how I started at Mount Auburn was crawling around looking for these maker's marks and signatures. And and this one is, is signed by Alpheus Carey, who was a very, uh, successful carver uh, and and is also buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So this is the first monument. It is, um, it kind of has a wonderful story too, because, uh, you know, it also says first tenant of Mount Auburn, but by the time this monument was erected in 1832 at Mount Auburn, other people had been buried. And the first tenant and the first burials actually a, a child up near the tower for the for the Boyd family. So I was talking about this European inspiration, and I thought I would share some of the tombstones from the cemetery in Athens. This is just what the founders of Mount Auburn and the new lot owners of Mount Auburn were inspired by. And in if you think about Boston in the 1830s. Um, you know, this Greek revival was really in vogue and a lot of the um, wealthy um, Bostonians were commissioning busts in the in the Greek style, um, you know, with with togas and they uh, were very interested in finding replicas of monuments like like the ones on the left to be placed um, for their memorials in Mount Auburn Cemetery. If you had a lot of money, you might bring something back from Europe, uh, like this this beautiful monument to Caroline Margaret um, Ward that has the the deathbed scene, that also is part of the the um, Greek revival. This this cult of of the family that was also very popular at Mount Auburn. Another pure classical form that was put up right at the entrance. It would have been the first thing you saw as you pass through the gates uh, was this monument to uh, Johann Gaspar Spurzheim, a Prussian phrenologist, the, the sort of sketchy science of, 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 of looking at your head to, to, to measure your uh, intelligence. I suppose that's a simple way of, of putting it, but he was um, he was here 
and uh, in in Cambridge lecturing. He had a very big lecture circuit and was wildly popular in 1832. And you know he just got exhausted and and died away from home. And so uh, many people uh, wanted to put a monument up in his honor and. Uh, there was a wealthy merchant, um, Sturgis, I think his name was, who uh, had just bought some marble monuments on spec in Italy to be used, to sell, to be used at Mount Auburn Cemetery. And, and so he uh, donated that monument for um, Mr. Spurzheim to be uh, remembered. And there was a lot of of guidebook text and content written about this monument. There were stereographs and souvenirs made about this monument. The, the cemetery contributed an iron fence uh, around the monument, which was the taste of the time. And so um, what's interesting to me as the curator is that this monument is, um, it's the first time this primary form is used in a cemetery in the United States. And now it can be found all over the world, in cemeteries all over the world, from Glasgow to, to California. It was um, wildly popular, and it was a copy of this tomb of Cornelius Scipio Barbatus that was found in the 1700s on the Appian Way in Rome. And today, here you can see it, the actual tomb in the Vatican Museum in Rome. It's exactly the same, except, you know, in ancient Rome, in ancient Greece, these sarcophagus were a special kind of limestone that you would put the body inside. And here at Mount Auburn, the monument to Spurzheim that's here, uh, is a solid block of of marble and the and the bodies buried below in the earth so it's not quite exactly the same but the doric frieze and and the volutes and the proportions it's actually called also an altar tomb is um is a form that we see everywhere and and once you see it um you know and you get interested in visiting cemeteries i'm sure you'll you'll recognize it but it 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 speaks a a lot to uh, the proprietors of Mount Auburn and, and what they were choosing to um, put up as their, as their memorials. There was another wonderful uh, citizen of Boston, actually of Salem, Nathaniel Bowditch, who when he died, the community wanted to get together and raised money to put a statue up in his honor. And one of the things we need to remember is that, you know, Mount Auburn was a forerunner of the public parks. And today we put monuments up in, in the park. But at, at this time, in 1847, there were no public parks that had statuary. And so we're back in a time before public parks. So this very public, I call it a civic monument, was put up right opposite the entrance to Mount Auburn uh, for everyone to see. And Nathaniel Bowditch is buried in his family lot on Tulip Path at Mount Auburn um, in another location. This is really a statue honoring him. It's not his memorial. And we call that a cenotaph when when a statue is, is put up in memory of someone, honoring someone, but the body isn't there um, below. So it's just a, a, a beautiful naturalistic um, monument. It's the first life-size. It's the first bronze statue that was ever cast in the United States. So it's very significant. It was um, carved and cast by uh, uh, the most distinguished uh, sculptor who was living in Boston at the time, Robert Ball Hughes. He was known as Ball Hughes. And he um, you know, we didn't use the word bronze at the time. It was 2,500 pounds and it was a statue of metallic castings. That's what it was called. And it's just the most wonderful um, depiction. 
it looks just like him. Uh, it really is a fine work of work of art, and it kind of transcends the vernacular monuments that were being placed uh, in Mount Auburn. So, as a work of art, it it deserves high praise, and it's it's a special piece in our collection. You may know him if you're if you're sailors because he was a self-taught uh, mathematician and navigator, and he um, corrected the the book, the American Practical Navigator, that that helps ships get safely to shore. Uh, this this wonderful, interesting monument I'm showing you now is another example, same year, 1847, of an early bronze. A monument to Charles Tory, who was a martyr uh, for the anti-slavery cause. He he died in a jail in Baltimore. It, I I call it a it's sort of a capped obelisk. It's it's triangular and it's on a triangular lot, but it has these two beautiful, uh, crude crude but very simple bronze elements as part of the memorial. One is a kind of medallion portrait of Tory, who was a minister, and and then another of a, of a female in, in again, this neoclassical um, garment wrapped around her, but she has ankles with broken uh, manacles on them and cornrows in her hair um, in, in honor of all of his work uh, as an abolitionist and someone who uh, wrote in a letter, it's better to, to die in, in jail with a clear conscience than, um, let's see what it says. It's better to die in prison with the peace of God in our breasts than to live in freedom with polluted conscience. That's what's inscribed on the monument. And for many years, I thought this was a laurel wreath, but in fact, it's a crown of thorns, which is so appropriate to his work. The most important work of art at, at Mount Auburn um, is represented here on the left with a very early 1850s photograph that was taken by Southworth and Hawes. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a photograph of the Amos Binney Monument, which uh, you can see on the grounds today. It's a very large, heavy marble monument that was carved in Rome by someone who's considered one of the best sculptors um, in our country at the time uh, by Thomas Crawford. And it's his only realized funerary monument. It, it, it's quite, quite beautiful. On one side, there's a, a carving of the male soul ascending, um, depicting Amos Binney who died in Rome. He was only 47 and his, his widow commissioned uh, the young sculptor, Thomas Crawford, who was working in Rome uh, to, to create this memorial. On the other side, uh, in the opposing niche is uh, incredible carving of a, a female who's very shrouded, carrying the urn, um, which is what his, his, uh, his widow did, it brought, brought back the remains Mrs. Binney brought back the remains of her husband to her lot here at Mount Auburn. We've got a lot of attention um, by that, uh, by, the, by the Binney Monument because it was designated a national treasure by the White House Millennium Committee to Save America's Treasures and the National Trust, considered one of the outstanding works of art in this country. And that led us to uh, paying a uh, paying attention to the works of art that are out on the grounds at Mount Auburn. And uh, we were able to secure um, an Institute for um, Museum and Library Services, Save Outdoor Sculptures, um, a, a Save America grant, uh, which gave us funds the first time a cemetery had received funding to research and document and interpret um, 30 of the most significant monuments at Mount Auburn. So a very important part of our role in caring for the monuments at Mount Auburn is, is to document them. Many of them are marble, like this beautiful marble morning glory on the left, and they don't uh, last in an outdoor environment. So 
one of our uh, uh, most important tasks as stewards is is to document these monuments as well as to monitor them for for conservation. So there's this beautiful 1857 Morning Glory, uh, a wonderful 1867 headstone um, to Peter Bias, who was a caterer in in Boston, um, depicting a a, a a bar relief that was made famous by Wedgwood in England for the abolitionist cause. And then uh, a wonderful urn from England that used to be placed on the Tontine Crescent in Boston, but now was brought to Mount Auburn as a memorial to the great architect um, Bullfinch. There are also significant are, are works of vernacular um, carving that are unique and, and that can't be found any other place. So we're very grateful to this grant for allowing us to uh, have a baseline documentation of our most significant monuments and also to digitize records such as this beautiful uh, watercolor that is done by Stanford White, the famous New York architect who collaborated on the Nevins Monument, the Henry Coffin Nevins Monument with Augustus St. Gaudens, the great sculptor. This is one of their earliest uh, collaborations here at Mount Auburn. One of my favorite monuments is very, very worn. Um, you know, the Victorian cemeteries are filled with vertical shafts and obelisks, and they're also filled with a lot of stock female figures representing charity or hope or faith. And, and and there are a lot of angels. So you see a lot of verticality and it would be easy to, to miss this monument. It's also quite worn, but it's incredibly important because it's a commission by uh, Dr. Harriet Hunt, who was alive when she commissioned uh, a sculptor named Edmonia Lewis to carve a statue of Hygieia for her lot at Mount Auburn. So Harriet Hunt ha has a lot. She's a doctor who has practiced for 40 years. She was a pioneering uh, female physician who, um, who, who was a reformer and advocated exercise and nutrition and temperance and physical and mental well-being. She really is a hero. And she wanted um, her patients to have you know, the benefits of physical and mental health. And so in 1870, she commissioned Edmonia Lewis, who uh, had been, had a studio in Boston in the, in the 1860s and was um, uh, getting quite well known in Boston for the busts that she was carving of Longfellow and Colonel Robert Gould Shaw. And, and, and so uh, Dr. Hunt commissioned her to do this statue, um, which she carved in Rome of the goddess of health and hygiene to remind uh, everyone who came to Mount Auburn, maybe some of what uh, Dr. Harriet Hunt uh, was hoping that uh, people would think about, which would be their health and well-being. And it's just a powerful story of a, of a woman who was quite remarkable, practicing 40 years in Boston and uh, commissioning, you know, a sculptor who was uh, half Chippewa and half um, Haitian. Her dad was from Haiti and her mom was um, from the Chippewa tribe who, who moved to Rome to find some more freedom where she could work. Uh, it's a very powerful story of a commission between two women that's represented here on our landscape. Here they are. Here's Dr. Harriet Hunt, who had a party after practicing for 40 years and gave herself a wedding ring to commemorate her 40 years as a doctor and planned ahead to have the statue by Edmonia Lewis, a wonderful Edmonia Lewis, um, in her lot at Mount Auburn. This too, this monument also is the only only um, memorial in a cemetery that we know of that Edmonia Lewis carved. This is a different kind of figure. Um, when Maria Frances Copenhagen 
died quite young. Um, her mom uh, hired a young uh, sculptor in Boston, Martin Milmore, to create a portrait of her daughter and make this memorial, which is the, the kind of angel of resurrection for um, for her daughter here. I think the Milmore, the um, the Copenhagens had five children and only only two of their children had had survived. Um, but this is this is six feet high. It was carved in Rome. This monument has the most magnificent wings. I'm not sure if you can see it, but when we were working with a conservator, we had um, there was scaffolding up there, and uh, the conservator just it, he could not he just couldn't get over the beauty, the palpable physicality of this statue, and it was um, we were very lucky to be able to look at it uh, so close up, and then I later learned that. Um, this was one of Martin Milmore, one of the sculptor's favorite statues that he had done. So this was done in 1872. And remarkably, that same year, he finished the, the, the magnificent, large granite sphinx at Mount Auburn, which is a memorial to the end of the Civil War. And, and it, it, it sits opposite, if you remember that first building, it sits opposite the Bigelow Chapel. And if you look over the right, the proper right shoulder of the Sphinx into the cemetery, you can see the, the tower, all these elements as part of the design of the original landscape that um, brought you in. This has a great story because Jacob Bigelow, who was the second president and a real passionate proponent of statuary and memorials at Mount Auburn, he had hoped that the cemetery trustees would commission a memorial to the fallen heroes of the Civil War. And um, they did not uh, vote that, the, pass, the, the vote didn't pass. So the tenacious Dr. Bigelow commissioned Martin Milmore to work with him to create a statue of the Sphinx that he designed, which was incorporating um, an American eagle and an American water lily and the military star of this um, this kind of iconic Egyptian um, mythical creature to to represent in ideal form the end of the war, but also looking forward to the United Nation. Um, the, uh, the 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 statue is you know still a favorite. It's it used to sit on this little mound and. Um, and now it has this wonderful garden around it. But it's um, it's been considered the most enigmatic Civil War memorial to uh, to have been created. And I think because it really was a, pub, a, a, a private commission that was then made to be to serve as a as a public memorial. It's a very interesting um, work of art and one of our um, most beloved landmarks. If you go over to Forest Hills Cemetery, you can see an extraordinary memorial, um, the Milmore Memorial, that's a bronze bas relief um, titled Death Staying the Hand of the Sculptor. And I, I took this picture just two days ago. I, I was at New York in New York at the Met, and they because it's such a magnificent work of art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York actually commissioned uh, this marble uh, from the bronze uh, somewhat later um, because uh, it, it, it's it's just been um, let's see what's beautiful about it it's it, it's a combination of idealism and ideal elements so you can see the poppies symbolizing sleep and the angel with her magnificent wings um, but also real here is Martin Milmore, the young sculptor, precocious and young and talented, carving the Sphinx at Mount Auburn Cemetery. A very beautiful, um, very beautiful work of art indeed. Which brings us to another um, well-known uh, and revered work of art that's on the Boston Common. Uh, probably many of you know that Colonel Robert Gould Shaw led one of the 
um, African American, one of the black regiments in the Civil War, and is depicted in this um, a a astonishing bas relief uh, in the in the Boston Common, uh, but is also remembered here at Mount Auburn Cemetery at his grandfather's memorial. This brownstone tempietto um, was erected in 1848 by the grandfather of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who led the 54th Regiment. And, and this is where many people uh, come to ra you know, give their respects to uh, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw. They, they laid a wreath here. Um, in the 19th century after the Civil War um, and uh, still do so. Um, it has a beautiful plaque to Colonel Robert Goldshaw that reads, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We have the um, drawings at the Boston Public Library, which incorporate a, a great early first century work of art from the art collection of Robert Goldshaw. And again, this is an 1850s daguerreotype by the great early photographers, Southworth and Hawes. This is one of our most significant monuments and it's up on the hill next to the Sphinx and next to Bigelow Chapel. So be sure to take a look at this um, uh, when you come. Uh, once we finished conservation of, of, of the monument, a few years ago, we had a visit by Governor Deval Patrick at the Veterans of the 54th and uh, a very uh, moving Toasting a Treasure celebration. So I'm, 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 I'm going fast, I realize, because each of these have so many stories to them, but I, I'm hoping to just wet your palate to invite you to come to Mount Auburn and experiencing uh, and experience these monuments for themselves and read read what they have to say. The Mary Baker Eddy Memorial is probably one of the most photographed. It is for certain one of the most photographed uh, monuments at, at the cemetery. It's this very beautiful 15 foot classical open colonnade that uh, reflects in Halcyon Lake. And it, it's just so picturesque. And this um, memorial commemorates Mary Baker Eddy, the discoverer and founder of the First Church Christ Scientist. And, and the church commissioned this after her death and had an architectural competition. And the architect uh, Edgerton Swartwood one one the commission and designed this after um, the Temple of the Winds in Athens, Greece. It was completed in 1917, and I, I love how the architect said he the only thing he wanted between her grave and the sky of heaven were were flowers, and they planted flowers, um, roses, which were her favorite here, and this. This particular monument is considered one of the greatest works of granite carving in the United States. It's it's very, very beautiful. The Menconi brothers in Queens, New York, did not have the skill or the manpower to carve it. And so they brought over from northern Italy 34 talented marble carvers to come to the studio in Queens and, and carve this monument. And um, it, it took quite a quite a lot uh, to to make this. It's beautiful in any any weather. It's carved of Bethel white granite, which looks like marble, but it's very strong. Here you can see a little bit more of the carving. Um, it's really one of the finest examples of garnet uh, of 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 carving in granite. A real beauty. So I know I need to wrap up. We've we've got five minutes left. So I'll just quickly say, you know, no matter how big or how small a monument is here at Mount Auburn or in any cemetery, they mean something to someone and they all have a story. I was just thinking how they're like books really in the landscape. And um, Mount Auburn was so popular that people, People came to see these monuments. They were written up in the newspaper and 
what you would do is you would get a guidebook and you would come walk through the cemetery with your guidebook in hand and a little map and you would read sentimental verse and you would you would read the inscriptions on the monuments. You might come for a dedication. And then of course you might want to bring home a souvenir and stereographs were the most affordable kind of souvenir that most um, households would have in the 19th century. And here of course is a magnificent monument uh, today in this fall weather uh, to William Frederick Harnden, who pioneered express services. And he earlier had a small monument, but the express companies raised this much bigger monument uh, with absolutely every symbol uh, possible and a beautiful uh, marble bas-reliefs depicting the sending and receiving of packages in the honor of, of, of Frederick Harnden. So, just to conclude, I hope you get the sense for me kind of sharing this range of monuments that, that Mount Auburn is really a singular treasure and a place where you can find history and beauty and art and memory all in, in nature. And that the monuments on the grounds all vary in size and they vary in aesthetic impact and purpose um, they're intimate, they're bold, they're modest, they're commanding. Um, and what we do here at, at Mount Auburn is really to mourn the departed at the same time as celebrating life. It's, it's, it's remarkable. It's remarkable how much a place of opposites this landscape can be, that you come to a place where people are grieving, but you leave uplifted. And I think that's in large part to the beauty of the cemetery, to the care of the grounds, and to what happens when nature is all around us. It's very hopeful. So as we move forward, um, this is our vision. We envision a world that celebrates life seasons, preserves natural beauty, and through the monuments and the artwork here, remembers human stories. Thank you everyone for joining me tonight. I hope you enjoyed that and I, and I hope uh, you have some questions that you might like to ask. I hope you have some interest in visiting Mount Auburn at some point. Uh, the weather has just been beautiful. Couldn't be more beautiful at this time of year. Well, thank you so much, Meg. We do have quite a few questions. And so I realize that we are two minutes to eight. So for those who are not able to stay with us, we will have a link to the recording sent in the recap so you can watch the program again and listen to some of the answers that uh, Meg is going to share with these questions, but um, I'll move forward with the questions. Uh, how much were the first plots? The first, there were two. There were two kinds of plots right at the very beginning. There was one that was three hundred square feet that was considered a big family lot, and that was sixty dollars. Or also at the beginning, you could buy a single grave for ten dollars. So it was much more affordable than it than it is today. There were, I've I read through the um, first deeds and there were blacksmiths and paper hangers and gentlemen and gentlewomen and um, seamstresses and um, a caterer, I mentioned a caterer earlier, um, a really wide range of working class and upper class. There um, were also lots that were purchased by churches and charitable organizations like the Scots Charitable Society um, that provided burials for people who didn't have the means to be buried at Mount Auburn. Great, thank you. Are there any presidents or Civil War military buried there? Yes, we have um, no presidents buried, but I was just putting together a list of all the presidents that have visited Mount Auburn. Um, but no one, no presidents buried here. We have more than 900 um, veterans and many, many Civil War veterans. We have one Confederate burial 
and a lot of programming and information about veterans buried here at Mount Auburn. The Civil War memorials are really beautiful. You know, I had not much time and it was hard not to share them because what happened with the Civil War was suddenly the monuments change and represent um, the people being commemorated with real hats and swords and gloves and they're very, very beautiful. Um, you know, there was a kind of realism that came in because the war was so tragic north south and and across families uh so that's that's a very rich part of our collection and there's a great book by drew gilpin faust that that talks about um nathaniel bowditch the um a young man who who died and his father coming to collect him from the civil war if you're interested in that um but some very beautiful civil war um memorials and um many veterans buried at Mount Auburn. Did the initial Egyptian aesthetic reflect the interest of a single patron or the emergence of Egyptian archeology span in the mid 1800s? Thank you for your question. Actually, thank you for all these questions. I love, I love hearing what, what you wanna know about. And Egyptian revival is a particularly fun subject because it was uh, very wildly popular here in Boston after Napoleon's um, trip to Egypt with all the artists and his book that was published. So Egyptian revival was, um, was very popular with the Boston intellectual community because of the metaphor that they saw between the cultures and because of the aspirational interest that, that Boston had, because remember they're young, they're 40 years young. It's a very young nation in becoming one of the great civilizations, like in becoming like Egypt and becoming like Greece and becoming like Paris even. They wanted America to be up there with the big, big societies that have lived many hundreds and thousands of years. And so that um, that interest in the Egyptian revival is, has been written a lot about. And Joy Jaguer has a really good book on the Egyptian revival in American cemeteries. Um, uh, so it was an, a, not a single pa patron in answer to your question, it was uh, a community. Not everyone liked the Egyptian Revival Gateway. There were some articles in the newspaper saying it wasn't appropriate for a Christian uh, cemetery to use such pagan imagery. Uh, however, it was not a Christian cemetery. It, Mount Auburn at the beginning was not um, denominational. It was open to every faith and every race. So it, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't. So that's, that's my answer there. Thank you. Um, my favorite architect is H.H. H. Richardson in our local rural cemetery, cemetery, Albany Rural. There is a Richardson designed tomb. Are there any in Mount Auburn? I wish there were. I mean, H.H. H. Richardson was very close to Olmsted. And many people think that Olmsted designed Mount Auburn because it's such a beautiful green space. But as um, many of you probably know, he was just a young boy. He was four in 18, I mean, he was eight in 1831. And so, uh, he, but, but interestingly, his firm did do some designs and I know Olmsted and Richardson were very close. Uh, no, I bet we could find some connection to H.H. H. Richardson, but as far as I know, um, there are no, monuments designed by H.H. H. Richardson here at Mount Auburn. Do you have responsibility or permission to maintain the monuments that is straightening, tipping monuments or raised sinking foundations or et cetera? Yeah, we as stewards, we do. But if there are, you know, a lot of the lots at Mount Auburn are no longer active. There are about 1,200 active lots now, I think. So um if it, it also there are incredible rules and regulations in place so the monuments are pretty you know they don't tip like a lot of other cemeteries they're not tipping over but a lot of times um you know we'll have a storm or a tree will come down or 
something will break or um, something wears away just by the nature of being outside. And so our first effort is to contact the family um, to see if we can in involve them. And then, uh, and then after that, there are perpetual care contracts that our preservation department uh, carry out, um, often just keeping the monument um, washed and plumb and pointed as long as it shall last. So the preservation uh, team, uh, you can see them working ac across the landscape in uh, a kind of three to five year cycle. Um, maintaining maintaining the monuments and at Mount Auburn, it's it's a little different with the uh, the significant monuments that I showed you uh, this evening because of their significance. In fact, and we are able to work with the families and with conservators, but really we don't do anything on a lot un unless we contact a family. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Stephen's curious to know, on the first monument, Adams, what does historian of the Jew mean? Well, I've never read her book that's the history of Jewish people. Um, that's, what it, that's what it means. She wrote a history of the Jewish sect. Um, and that I guess that was a, a, a very a popular book for her so that they called it out on her monument. Um, but I haven't, I haven't read it. So that's what I assume a historian of the Jews. Yeah. She was a historian and she wrote about Jewish people. That's what it means. Thank you. Uh, isn't the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial Cenotaph? I think he is buried it with is. the soldiers at Bag Battery Wagner in Charleston, North Carolina. Uh, South Carolina. He is exactly. It's just a cenotaph. It's just a plaque on his family memorial. Thank you so much. I've I've cut back. There's so much information to, to share about that beautiful monument. It was designed by Hammett Billings, who was like the Martha Stewart of Boston. He did the fireworks for Boston. And he illustrated Uncle Tom's cabin. He did many monuments at Mount Auburn. He wrote about the monuments at Mount Auburn, and he designed this magnificent monument. And it has brownstone and marble and slate and an iron fence and an underground tomb and this beautiful plaque that was just placed there in memory of Colonel Robert Goldshaw, who's buried with his men. That very important decision made by his parents, who were both very progressive, active abolitionists. They felt that that was very appropriate for their son. And I'm um, such a tragic, heroic story. Thank you for bringing that up. I left that out. Uh, Nancy's curious, what is the inscription over the main entrance to the cemetery? Oh, yes, that's from the Bible. Even though Mount Auburn isn't um, Christian, there is a religious Western Christian tradition that um, that uh, is from Ecclesiastes. Uh, I don't have it written down in front of me. I don't have it in my head, um, but it, it, but it is have it is what's said at, often at funerals. Dust to dust. I can look it up. No, I just I'll lose this slide if I look it up. But it's it's a quote from the Bible. Also, you know, there's an interesting. We we talked about it, the Egyptian revival imagery there that was designed by Jacob Bigelow. He actually covered the heads of the snakes with lotus flowers so they wouldn't be you know so they would be more modest for the boston community i think that's an interesting detail of that design that you see right there in the in the in the capstone it's a quote from ecclesiastes i'd be happy to send it to you i have it written down i just don't have it in my head Oh, the vocabulary of cemeteries is a great question. Uh, there's a question in the chat that says, please talk about the vocabulary of cemeteries. Mount Auburn Cemetery is the first time the word cemetery is used in this country. 
So in 1831, when Mount Auburn Cemetery named itself after the tallest hill at Mount Auburn that they named Mount Auburn after a poem, a romantic poem, they used the word cemetery. They, the, the founders, Jacob Bigelow, also talked with Edward Everett, Joseph Story, Dearborn. They tossed around the word necropolis and decided not to use necropolis. Um, uh, Père Lachaise Cemetery was, um, was called uh, a cemetery, cemetière, and that would have been an inspiration. That was found in 1804. And the word cemetery in Greek means place of sleep, which reflects this new romantic idea. Um, so that's, that's the shift that came in the United States with, with the founding of Mount Auburn Cemetery. Uh, how many open plots are available now is, is a question about sales. There are a couple hundred more years of, of, of we call them lots at Mount Auburn or graves and lots um, that are available, but they haven't been laid out. So we don't have a number. Um, it's interesting. We do about 600 burials a year, 1,200 cremations a year, 10% of our burials are natural burials. So there are a lot of different ways to be buried at Mount Auburn, a lot of different options from memorial trees and memorial benches to natural burials to cremations. Um, uh, so I can't, I can't give you a, a number. I think the demand is incredibly high and that staff are working really hard to keep up with demand uh, at this moment. And there's a new vision plan at Mount Auburn, which is calling for uh, calling for um, calling for more space uh, that's more affordable. Thanks. So Helen, are you able to work your uh, microphone a little bit better? Well, I just um, ditched the headphones, so I think you can probably hear me fine now. I can um, hear you, terrific, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there are a couple of questions about guidebooks and um, see map and storybooks available, as well as audio tours that you can take while driving through your car. I'm just going to lump all of that into one question for you. Yeah, there's a visitor center where you can buy a book that I wrote, the book that I wrote with Melissa, and uh, different materials about the cemetery. I think you can sometimes find uh, them on the website again where we have a new website that we're um, we're just trying to um, uh, add all that content to right now so I'm not sure um, there isn't one guidebook but there are many different books um, there are maps and there's uh, a book about consecration Dell there's a little book about um, um, birds and birding. There's a wonderful book by um, Stephen Kendrick. There's a, a picture book of photographs by Richard Cheek, um, Blanche Linden Ward's iconic history of the cemetery called Silent City on a Hill is available. So th there's a lot available um, to purchase if you're interested and um, want to go online to the online store or go to the visitor uh, center. Let's see, isn't Mount Auburn um, in 99% in Watertown, Mass? Not 99%, but I think out of the um, 175 acres, 11 acres are, uh, are in Cambridge. So most of it is in Watertown. The main address is in Cambridge, but most of the land, Mary Baker Eddy is in Cambridge, but most of the land is in um, yeah, in, uh, in Watertown. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Rebecca is curious to know whether the bird's nest was put there by someone or built there by the birds. Yeah, that was, that was, that was completely not put there. We just discovered that there after the monument was, uh, was conserved. I, I just, I love that. <laughs> I just absolutely love that 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 happened. It was really uh, very, very moving. 
particularly well, the way that, that you know the 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 sculpture has her hands cupped like that it was right in that cupped area yeah yes it's very beautiful um yeah. thank you so much for sharing um all of the beautiful images of these remarkable monuments at mount auburn cemetery it was such a wonderful presentation we had so many more questions but certainly um we're running out of time and i uh, want to thank you again for joining us it's so nice to see you back here thank you all thank you for your questions come back email send them here bring them here and uh, we'll continue the conversation and hope to see you at the library thank you very much helen thank you everyone good night bye